cornflakes, corn on the cob, popcorn, corn shop. Oh, hey, hey, <laughs> sorry guys. I am just surrounded by enough food to feed hundreds of people. And it's lunchtime, so I'm just a little, a little hungry. Not even a hundred years ago, it would have been impossible to grow this much food on this land. Advances in agriculture have performed real miracles to make all of this possible. But with a growing population, we are going to have to find ways to help farmers even more and make sure that we protect the environment at the same time. What if agriculture could use the best of traditional and cutting edge techniques to actively restore nature while also increasing food production? Well, that is what we call regenerative agriculture. What was the most important revolution in human history? Need to think about it? The agricultural revolution. Actually, there have been three agricultural revolutions. Farming began by experimentation, taking wild plants and figuring out what traits made them grow bigger, faster, and taste better. Different styles of farming developed in different places. The first agricultural revolution was doing agriculture in the first place. The second agricultural revolution came with industrialization. Before, farmers did everything by hand. Now, there were machines to do it faster, and we kept on developing better plants and techniques. The third agricultural revolution is more recent than you think. It's possible your grandparents remember a time before it. Starting in the 20th century in industrialized countries and spreading around the world by the 1980s, this green revolution saw much wider use of fertilizers and pesticides and better irrigation. For the first time, it saw things like aerial application of chemicals, whole field timed irrigation, and mechanized sowing and harvesting. As more advanced genetic techniques came into being, people were able to develop even higher yielding crops. In India, the IR8 hybrid of rice, introduced in 1960, produced 10 times the yield of traditional rice. Every time, these developments have allowed us to grow more food to feed our growing population and led to better nutrition and better lives for billions. So, what does the next agricultural revolution look like? Well, it's going to have to solve some of the problems faced by modern agriculture and the consequences to the environment. Over the last century, we have designed our food systems to feed the world, and it has done so very successfully. But it has also had unintended consequences on nature. And so we now need to really look at developing a food system that not only is designed to increase production for food, but also plays a role in just restoring nature, that it leads to meeting our climate and biodiversity goals. One major challenge is soil depletion and erosion. Soil that is heavily farmed tends to become less fertile, as nutrients are taken up by crops and beneficial soil organisms are damaged by fertilizers and pesticides. Soil is also constantly being lost to wind and water erosion. Just in the United States, 10 billion tons of fertile soil are lost every year. Agriculture also needs land. The more forest, wetlands, and grasslands converted to farming and livestock raising, the less there is for wildlife habitat and storing carbon. Then there's the issue of what goes into farms and what comes out. Our water supplies face increasing demands from many places. There must be ways to reduce or more efficiently use the water needed by crops. And we have to reduce the fertilizer-filled runoff from farms which can lead to algae blooms and massive dead zones in lakes and the ocean. Last, our new revolution needs to curb agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, from production to transportation, even fertilizer, which I bet you thought came from manure. 
is usually made from natural gas. Currently, 38% of the Earth's land area is used to produce food. If that sounds like a lot of challenges, it is. But the encouraging thing is, we've done this before, and the new revolution is happening already. All over the place, in ways both traditional and modern, people are working to make agriculture better for people and the planet. We're sending my friend Courtney to investigate some of the ways they're doing it. I'm at Franklin Farm in central Illinois, and what you can see here is about 125 acres of soybeans. But what makes this place special is what you won't see, bare fields. So what is usually done after a harvest? So what's normally done after you harvest your corn and soybeans is that you're typically left with very little residue on the ground or even bare ground such as this. And so that can be vulnerable to erosion and also to wind damage and also losing a lot of carbon. So what can we do to protect the soil after harvest? Well, one thing that can be done is called cover cropping. And so these are crops that would be planted either within the soybean crop in the fall or right after. And that is something that would grow uh, throughout the winter and keep the soil exactly where it needs to be until the next spring. Oh, okay. Can you give me some examples of cover crops? Some common ones around here are cereal rye, uh, annual ryegrass, and even types of oats and radish that can be planted. It all depends on the needs of the field. Okay, so some can be cash crops and some are just plants. Right, some are just put on strictly for that conservation purpose. Okay, so a lot of multi-purpose there. Multi-purpose cover crops, yeah, they're good for a lot of things. Very cool. <laughs> To see how cover crops protect against erosion, we're going to try a little experiment. Yes, so what we have here are two drink bottles that are filled with uh, soil, but over here we have soil that doesn't have any cover crops, basically nothing protecting it from the elements. And then over here we have soil that has the use of cover crops on it. In this case, it's a type of grass. Gotcha. So what I'll do first is simulate some rainfall and we'll do it on the bare soil first and we'll see what happens. So here we go. looking pretty dirty. All right, I'm seeing a, a lot of dirty water coming right, out. Right, exactly. So this is what happens when we get a decent rainfall. You're gonna see a lot of the top soil coming off. It's gonna be very dirty. Well, you don't have anything protecting your soil. That's just gonna run right off into the adjacent creeks and you're gonna lose a lot of your topsoil. You're losing carbon, you're losing good nutrients, all those types of things. All things that you need. Exactly, and that's just going to our adjacent waterways and not staying where it should be. I see, all right. So let's compare that to a field that's got cover crops. Simulate a rainfall. Mm -hmm. All right, slowly but surely, it's coming out. A lot slower than before. And really clear. Like, I could almost drink that. So that's what we're really looking for here. It should come out a little bit slower and a lot cleaner. So what the roots are doing here with this grass is they're retaining those soil particles, even though we have the same amount of rain coming in. So the cover crop is doing its job. And so that's the benefit of having a cover crop. You keep the soil where it should be, and you've got a lot less running off to your waterways. Cover crops do lots more for soil. They help it hang on to the good things that plants need to grow. Nutrients that are often sourced from fertilizer can actually be provided by some cover crops. But I'll show you a pillage radish over here. Fred Yoder is a fourth generation farmer and Nature Conservancy trustee in Ohio. So this tillage radish, which it's basically a little white, looks like a white carrot. There's a tremendous amount of nutrients that are stored in that radish right there. And then when the radish decomposes, that becomes available for the next crop. The one bad thing about these radishes is when they start decomposing, they don't smell the best. We had an incident where the, the neighbors thought there was a cadaver out in the field and they called the sheriff looking for a body. Each and every cover crop brings something different. This plot right here, there's actually 18 different species comes back down to uh, what is it giving the soil. And some of these things like sorghum sudan grass, you can actually grow fertility. So if you let that get up to like six or eight feet and mow it and let it regrow, you can get as much as 50 pounds of phosphorus, 50 pounds of, of, of potassium that you don't have to add with a synthetic product. So we can grow our own fertility, so to speak. When farmers don't till or turn the soil, carbon stays where it is. So think about this. What makes the soil so good in a forest? 
We don't do any tillage there. We don't do anything. The leaves lay on there from the trees and it just keeps building and decaying and it's just some of the best soil that you could ever imagine. We can sequester enormous amounts of carbon. If we don't touch those roots and we don't stir the soil, it stays in the soil. When farmers can't manage the extra expense or effort of cover cropping, there are other less intensive ways, like conservation tillage. Northwest India, especially the states of Punjab and Haryana, were at the epicenter of the Green Revolution in the 60s. This has come at a cost. It has led to unintended consequences related to high use of fertilizers and pesticides, overuse of groundwater, and really deterioration of soil health. What we are seeing is a lot of farmers are basically burning the rice residue. This has obviously led to a huge consequence in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of air quality, and which has actually disproportionately impacted more of the poor and vulnerable in this region. What we are trying to do we know that there are technology solutions that can help farmers to really seed the weed without burning the rice harvest. A new type of harvester, called happy seeder, leaves some of the straw standing. This small change makes a huge difference because roots remain to anchor the soil and provide nutrients. Using the new technique, farmers only need to use their tractors one-fifth as much as previously, saving fuel, emissions, and soil disturbance. There is more carbon stored in soil than in all vegetation and the atmosphere combined. Another revolutionary practice doesn't even happen on the field. It happens around it. Back at Franklin Farms, we've come to the edge of the crop line where for over 15 years, they've been returning the farm to its original wetland state. So Krista, can you tell me what benefits do these wetlands provide? That's a great question. On the bigger picture, wetlands are here to help filter out some of the nutrients that may be running off of our farm fields, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus that may come off of our crop fields. All the crops that are here do need nitrogen and phosphorus specifically, and uh, too much of those when they run off into our creeks and our rivers, it all flows down to the Gulf of Mexico and creates really large algae blooms. And then we have the giant dead zone where nothing can live because there's too much algae. Yikes, okay. Yeah. So I take it there is a reason that this wetland is at the edge of the field. Correct. So these wetlands were specifically designed to be at the actual edge of these fields where water would want to drain. Mm -hmm. And so these wetlands are taking in that water that would be coming off and they're doing a great job at filtering that water, specifically for nitrogen and phosphorus. So they do that through the plants and also through the bacteria. They're also home to a lot of different plants and animals. Uh, over here, we've got uh, rushes. We also have some arrowhead plant here. Uh, there's cattails in the distance. And then we also have lots of dragonflies and frogs um, that call this place home, as well as migratory birds, and even some mammals come by. Wow, what a cool place. It's a pretty cool place. <laughs> in here is all of our water quality monitoring. We've had our equipment installed since 2007, and so we've been collecting year-round ever since then. So we've got anywhere from 12 to 15 and beyond years of data. All right. What we found over time is that these wetlands do an excellent job at reducing nitrates and phosphorus coming through. A wetland as small as this first one, this 3%, mm -hmm. can reduce nitrate levels uh, 15 to 38% and phosphorus levels 53 to 80%. Wow, that seems pretty effective. It's very, very effective, and that's really great to see. You don't have to take much land out of production to really see those reductions. So a little wetland goes a long way. Absolutely. Wetlands are just one of these edge of field practices. There are lots of other helpful things you can plant around fields, like pollinator gardens filled with flowering native plants. They can boost biodiversity and provide habitat for insects that help fertilize crops, or green buffer zones that help fight soil loss. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico varies year to year from 2.5 
2 million acres to over 5 million acres. You might have noticed that a lot of these practices seem to rely on promoting a more balanced ecosystem. And that's true. Agriculture has depended on natural solutions for a long, long time. And some of the best preservers of these traditional techniques have been indigenous peoples. That's why, in Nebraska, some farmers are embracing ideas that come from a surprising place. The home of the Maya people in Central America. Our milpa system, every plant is allowed to grow. So the three sisters are corn, beans, and squash. When they grow, the corn provides support for the bean to grow. In return, bean provides this nitrogen that corn needs to grow healthy. And squash, it has a really huge, big, you know, round leaf, and it provides shade. And so every plant has a use in the milpa system. It's an incredible example of how plants used properly together can benefit each other. Look at the size of this sunflower. It's huge. <laughs> it's so beautiful. The farm is always evolving. Um, and we're always learning more. It's exciting to be a part of the solution. Corn, beans, and all kinds of squash over here. We can combine this ancient wisdom with emerging understanding in soil health. There are more than 570 million farms worldwide. Almost 75% of them family owned. I am starting to realize just how hot it is out here in all of these crops. You know what? I wish there was a tree right about there. The trees here at the University of Illinois Research Farms aren't just here to look pretty. They do so much more. They're part of a research experiment in agroforestry, integrating trees into the farming landscape. So MJ, these trees aren't here by chance. What's the purpose of planting them here? So these trees are part of a food forest. This site was designed to mimic a natural system, but we're growing food. So what are some of the other benefits that these trees are providing here at the farm? Yeah, trees are really good at being sponges on a farm. Trees are really good at taking in the rain and keeping it in the ground through their massive root systems. Mm -hmm. They create this canopy of shade, which helps keep the soil beneath it cool. And with that effect, it keeps water in the soil as well. So I know that on farms, it's really important to have good soil. Do the trees help with that? Yeah, totally. So trees hold the soil with their big, long roots. When you have perennial roots in the ground, they're holding onto that soil for decades, for millennia for as long as the trees are living. So that creates really great climates within the soil, so all the microbes that live down there. And then it creates better climates for all the things that grow above ground. Okay. I've also noticed that it's like a little less windy over here than over there. Is that a benefit as well? Yeah, that's a huge benefit of agroforestry. Um, one of the main agroforestry practices that farmers use in the Midwest is um, windbreaks. Okay. So windbreaks are planted on the edge of fields and they help shelter corn or soybeans or any kind of row crop from the strong winds that come through this part of the U.S. I do have one more question. Earlier on you had mentioned food. Is that food for people? Yes, of course. Do you want to try some? I would love to. Okay, let's do it. Here's a good one. This is delicious. What else you got? This is a hazelnut bush, and these are hazelnuts. Gotta take off the shell. Ooh. Oh, hey, oh my this gosh. one looks great. Mm -hmm. tastes, tastes like hazelnut. Mm. 
Yeah. This is an American plum. It's a native fruit. So, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> it's pretty sour. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so tart. <laughs> they wake you up. Definitely. <laughs> I'll eat this one. Okay. <laughs> so why would farmers want to grow this kind of food on their farm? So the kind of food that grows on shrubs and trees, this is stuff that's a lot different than corn and soybeans or other kinds of annual crops. It diversifies farmers' income streams. Mm -hmm. That means that they make a profit not only off of the corn, but they could also make it from the trees and the shrubs and the food that they produce. So it's like these trees are nourishing both the farm and the community. Exactly. Yes. I love that. Agroforestry currently represents less than 2% of U.S. agriculture. So, now that you've got an overview of the different ways we can make regenerative agriculture work, how do we make it work in more places? No till okay. Well, we have to remember that farming means experimenting. All of these practices have to be evaluated every year, both for economic and ecological benefits. And it's not one size fits all. Just like crops are suited to particular environments, so are different techniques. There is no such thing as a silver bullet to farming. There's lots and lots of different tools we use in the toolbox. So I call that a lot of silver buckshots. Put that buckshot together and you've got a system. This is what I like to see. That's good soil there. But scaling up regenerative agriculture solutions can work because soil health practices, conservation tillage, and others can be used anywhere. Kind of inspiring, right? And while you might not be able to grow crops where you live, there are lots of things you can do to help and learn more about regenerative agriculture. You can do your own soil improvement by composting vegetables or even lawn clippings. Look at that great soil. And at the same time, you're sending less food waste to the landfill and reducing carbon emissions. Protect pollinators. Plant a pollinator garden with native plants like this one at the Nature Conservancy. Or a food garden for yourself. Sign up for a community garden or plant one in your backyard. And support the farmers doing good work. Shop local, and when you can, organic. Look for local farmers markets where small producers are likely to be selling. Or you can sign up for a CSA or crop sharing where you subscribe to receive produce directly from a farm or a group of farms. Whatever you do, Take a moment to consider this. We live in exciting times at the front lines of the regenerative agriculture revolution.